It's because it's happened at a very sensitive moment for China. That's the main reason. And the sensitivity is that China is hosting or is uh, scheduled to host the Winter Olympic Games in February next year. So it's not far off now. And uh, democratic governments around the world have been saying that they're weighing the option of a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Games. So that's not a when you hear boycott and Olympics, you think uh, no athletes, but it's not that option uh, that hasn't been on the table. Governments led by the US have been weighing the idea of a diplomatic boycott, which is not sending leaders, ministers or officials uh, as guests to the host country, which is a snub. It's a minimalist uh, sort of rebuke to China over human rights violations, but it is nonetheless a snub. So with that in mind and those games about to uh, to begin in February, uh, this Pung case came at a very sensitive moment, uh, and that's why um, the Chinese government has really uh, uh, started to respond, and as you say, to craft an illusion. Uh, but n nonetheless, that's much more than the Chinese government has gone to the trouble of creating for almost any other human rights violation case. Uh, in, in recent years. It's so concerning too that the IOC played into this charade that it is not itself holding Beijing accountable for the uh, you know, essential disappearance of yet another high profile person. Well the IOC behaviour in this case is uh, consistent with how most major international sporting bodies have behaved towards the Chinese regime. Um, which is to put their commercial interests first, uh, to, uh, to try to appease the government, to pander, if I can use that word in, uh, in, uh, in the context of China, <laughs> forgive me, uh, to pander to the Chinese, thank you, I'll take it, uh, to pander to the Chinese government um, to protect its own interests. And of course, the IOC has an enormous uh, financial investment in the going ahead of the Winter Olympics in Beijing in February. So that's consistent with traditional, I mean, most of the NBA and notoriously in, the, in America, but others as well. What's different in this case is, and one, and one of the reasons that it's reached such high profile uh, and has become such, uh, you know, an international uh, cause in recent days is, is the other sporting body that's got involved, which is the US-based Women's Tennis Association. And... Um, the way that it's really distinguished itself by not putting money first, by putting the rights of its athletes first and demanding that Peng Shui be uh, shown to be at liberty, that her complaint, which is a, a complaint of rape against one of the, China's former leaders uh, who is still living comfortably in Zhongnanhai, the leadership compound um, in the old Imperial Gardens in the middle of Beijing, that, they, that, that, case, that her case be taken seriously and they've refused to be appeased or palmed off by the, as you say, constructions of an illusion of everything's normal um, and she's happy and, and leave us alone. Yeah. So then it brings pressure on countries. I mean, the US has indicated it is considering that diplomatic boycott. Should Australia be doing the same? Should other nations be joining? Well, there's two, two points I'd make, Bev. One is that um, uh, Joe Biden has said for months now that the US is considering uh, such a ban, a diplomatic boycott on the games. And last week, the Washington Post reported that he was uh, ready to make the announcement by the end of the month that the US would, in fact, impose a diplomatic boycott. So not send the president, the vice president, cabinet secretaries or senior officials uh, and snub the event in a rebuke to China on its human rights record. And if that were to happen, then you would see, uh, based on the rhetoric and the positioning, you'd s almost certainly see London take the same position and Canberra take the same position and possibly some other democratic states as well. Um, but then there's a question of whether Australia should, which, you, which is your question, should Australia do that? Well, it's, the point's been made to me by members of the Morrison government that at the moment it would be ridiculous for Australia under a two-year-old political ban on any contact with Beijing. So Beijing's imposed not just a political freeze, but also, as you know, more than $20 billion worth of uh, punitive commercial uh, strikes on Australian industry, banning, uh, banning Australian exports. It would be ridiculous for Australia to send officials to a sporting event when it's under those sort of sanctions from Beijing and under uh, w without any sign of any relenting from Beijing uh, or any sign that uh, an Australian official would be given 
an audience with the president or whatever, mm. uh, there is no will in the Australian government uh, to do anything other than join an international boycott should Joe Biden declare one. Yeah, interesting. Now, uh, it was interesting that Xi was talking to the ASEAN nations just yesterday, saying China poses no threat. It doesn't intend to be a bully in the region. Is anyone buying that? Uh, well, the ASEAN leaders themselves, um, of course, uh, there are a couple. So Camb Cambodia, Laos, that are essentially uh, client states of China. They won't object, they'll, they'll, they'll go along with that. Uh, most of the ASEANs who have been feeling the sharp edge uh, of Chinese uh, coercion and intimidation in the region will not buy it. Uh, if the Chinese regime was serious about that rhetoric, uh, it, would, it would now be signing or would already have signed with the heads of the ASEAN states a code of conduct uh, to govern disputes in the South China Sea and the conduct of nations. That uh, code of conduct has now been under negotiation, allegedly, since 2003. The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi a couple of years ago said we are not in any, in any rush uh, to sign that. And the reason is clear. The Chinese government doesn't want to be constrained. The ASEAN countries want it to be constrained. And so the ASEANs are very anxious to have that signed. There's talk about it uh, at that virtual summit yesterday between China and the ASEAN heads of government, but no real progress. And it will not be signed because China does not want to be constrained. And I'll just finish with the observation from the Philippines uh, Foreign Secretary, Tedoro uh, um, Loxin, who has said that having China in the South China Sea and sharing that, that, that waterway uh, between the Philippines and China, he said is, quote, like having a dragon in your living room. That is extraordinary. <laughs> and I think a lot of countries feel just that kind of pressure. Great to talk, Pete. Thanks so much. Pleasure, Bev.